We're very pleased to have Paulette Jordan with us today. Let's give her a warm City Club welcome. That is a very warm welcome from Dr. Adler. Thank you so much. <laughs> Actually incredible to remember all of that. It's a lot. <laughs> so first of all, I want to say good afternoon. My name is Paulette Jordan. I'm running for governor of our state. And we have some fabulous people in the audience. So we have a congressman, Mike Simpson. Thank you for being here. And please don't take offense if I don't see you right away because I, I just Notice Mike, he's actually an old friend, so thank you and for coming in. Of course, one of my very dear friends, who is my office mate, Representative Lyndon Bateman. He is here. Very good friend. Thank you so much for coming out to support. Uh, so it's been incredible, this campaign. You know, in fact, I've uh, been around the state my entire life. I was uh, raised here in Pocatello, in Blackfoot, on my parents' 200-acre horse ranch. And every time I came down, I always enjoyed getting to know the community. And what I remember being uh, quoted by saying, this is a beautiful area. And someone challenged that and say, said, why, do you, why would you call Pocatello beautiful? <laughs> I mean, you're from northern Idaho, where it's God's country. And I said, well, because of the people. The people make it beautiful. You know, every time I've come here and visited or spent time, every single one of you has been very generous and kind to me. And you never forget that. And I also just think it's just the Idaho way for people to be very kind and, and genuine and generous uh, with how they are uh, sharing their resources, being a good neighbor, uh, and it, it's exactly what I fight for in my gubernatorial campaign, which is to ensure that Idahoans have that value injected into our politics. Because right now, I don't really see that happening. Uh, some of the frustration that I have is simply that the resources are not coming back to our people. And it is the very reason why I have never left Plummer, Idaho, where I was born and raised. Uh, in that area, in North Idaho, if anyone has ever been, it's very gorgeous. And by the way, raise of hands because I'm a little shocked when people say they've never been. Okay, less than half. We're going to fix that. <laughs> a lot of folks have never been to North Idaho. It's a different culture for some. Uh, but for me, it's home. And yes, you know, I was uh, raised on my family farmland. And my grandfather, in fact, was a rancher. He ranched roughly a million and a half acres of land. My family on my mother's side, they were uh, farmers, and they farmed roughly mostly wheat, uh, some timothies, some Kentucky bluegrass, pulses, which I now inherited, and I, that's the, the same crop that I continue to grow. Uh, and I'm a timberland owner, so I have a lot of interest in maintaining our culture uh, of forestry, management, and uh, of course, pressing out our contracts for our loggers. Uh, and in this community that I come from, which is very humbling, you know, our people, but I'm finding out I have less and less resources to get by. So I'm constantly sharing our stories from everyone from Northern Idaho to Southern Idaho to ensure that everyone gets why this uh, race is so important. You know, it's imperative that people get out to vote. And uh, to know uh, displacement, those who identify in any particular party, but I'm often reminding even our younger generations that you have to have faith because this race is not about party politics. People have to realize that this state is actually not, in fact, a Republican state, even though it appears to be so. Many, like my generation, are independent. Many in Idaho just do not vote. And because those of us who are independent voters are not turning out, Idaho is reflective of what it is now. I have no real lean one way or the other because I find that what it comes down to is simply being Idahoan, first and foremost. You know, I'm actually very progressive with a conservative mindset towards this architectural framework that supports good governance. I want to see us get back to that. I want to see us ensure that government works for the people rather than working against us. And I think for those of us who understand that as gun owners, as people who are built on the autonomy of our land, I believe in sovereignty of our, our local communities. I, lo I support the local autonomy of our local towns and cities. I want to ensure that regulation is held at the local level because it's actually imperative that citizens have a seat at the table. They should have a part in this decision-making process. We should increase participatory government. 
So as governor, this is what I see, which is not becoming of our, my predecessor, in fact, but watching how legislation left and right has been more so contradictory towards local control or smaller government. And because I've stemmed from this land that comes from thousands of years of leaders, chiefs who are both men and women, serving the people for the greater good, I have yet to see that here in the State House in my terms. And I've served there for four years. And I found multiple challenges with communication and people being able to rise above the party politics. And as governor, that's going to be our challenge, is ensuring that both sides of the aisle are working together. But this is really truly how we bring Idaho together for the future generations, because how I'm looking to insert our vision is looking to address the next seven generations' lifestyle, ensuring that we have education at the forefront, healthcare that's not only accessible, but affordable for all. Ensuring that we're protecting public lands. Talking about clean energy, decarbonizing our energy future. We have multiple responsibilities ahead of us. Ones that we sit on right now. And as governor, this is going to be my challenge, but one that I'm working to build a plan and have solutions for. So these solutions are what we want to talk about today. I promised Dr. Adler and others that I would do less talking because usually at these town halls, in meetings like this, I will talk for an hour, but I promise you all that it's best that we just get straight to questions because I know many of you have good questions. So that being stated, just a little bit about myself, who I am, national business leader, uh, very deeply connected and rooted to the ag industry, the timber industry, uh, mother of two, yes, played a little bit of basketball my younger years, my last lifetime, uh, but now simply running for governor, not exactly by choice. You know, everything that I've done is always by the request of others. And that's kind of the challenge, is when you're working hard and you're doing good things, you naturally get voluntold to do this, <laughs> to run for office. So I was voluntold to run for governor because they said, we need a voice like yours. We need leadership. So here I am. So please, ask away. Thank you. Thanks for opening the door to the many questions that your very attentive audience has here. Uh, thank you. So we have several questions that address uh, some recent changes in your campaign staff. Uh, would, you, would you please explain to the audience uh, the changes that you've made, why they ca came about, and do you think that that affects or, or portends the kind of governing strategy uh, that you would bring to to the office should you be elected? Well, these sorts of questions I think come with the double standard of being the first of anything. And first woman in our state, which is, you know, wholly our responsibility to make happen. But what I find out is the bigger you become in name and recognition, and I've been told, you know, we are a nationally recognized leader and people are really looking to us across the world to make a difference, not only in our state, in our country, but literally across the globe. I find that there's a, a lot of responsibility in that. And so when there are small little shifts, which are very common, uh, people will certainly exploit that shift. Uh, but in all due respect for those who uh, come through, we get thousands of people who volunteer. We get hundreds of people who want to work for the campaign. Uh, so it's naturally, of course, very common to have uh, any kind of shift like this happen. And of course, across the country, I'm really thankful that people have reached out and said, Yes, this happens uh, to all of us, and you know, for myself, I'm very big on ensuring that leadership is representative of not only my campaign, but the state of Idaho. So anytime there is uh, anyone who does not stick to the good message that my campaign represents, then of course they're going to have to look <coughs> elsewhere. So as a follow-up, Ms. Jordan, uh, the changes you've made, in, in your view, promote more representation of the Idaho view on political issues, is that what you're indicating? Absolutely. It's about leadership in this campaign and ensuring the integrity of everyone. Right, okay, thank you. Uh, shifting gears slightly, some wonder about the funds that you've been able to raise here in Idaho and out of state. Could you comment on the status of your fundraising and, and, and where your contributions are coming from? Good. I hope this is the same question you will ask my opposition as well, in all due fairness. Uh, 
clearly everything is above ground. And thank goodness for Senator John Peavy, who is my treasurer, because he was one who helped promote, promoted in his day and age the transparency of our finance laws and any contributions given to campaigns. And uh, because of that reason, we will clearly have reports that will come out and will show where every single dollar is coming from. Uh, in fact, money does come from Idaho. We've had over 12,000 people contribute. On average, $40 per person. Some people five. I had someone give three. Someone gave 5,000. They maxed. Uh, that's just average for a campaign. And, and thank goodness uh, everyone across the country is contributing in some way or another because Idaho needs a lot of help. We're up against special interest groups and corporations, uh, very wealthy individuals. And people, not only our neighbors uh, in the Northwest, but people everywhere in the world and the country, that want the, while they're not only watching and supportive of, uh, that you'll see where the dollars are coming from. But clearly a very clean run campaign. We are very transparent about everything. So I do implore that people look at those reports on both sides so that you are more comfortable with where these dollars are coming from. Thank you. In a, in a related matter, we have a couple questions asking about your practice or your campaign's practice of asking campaign aides to sign non-disclosure agreements. Can you comment on, on why that was done and, and your rationale? Gosh, you all really lean on Cynthia Sewell's. So, uh, <laughs> you know, the media really like integrity with the, the statesman. It's, uh, it's unfortunate, but uh, given that the lack of integrity has certainly you know, misconstrued the, the reality of everything. Uh, the closure, the non-disclosure agreements, I mean, if, does anyone know what those are? Are you guys familiar with those? Those are very common. Um, actually, I did not apply them in my primary. I didn't think those were necessary. Uh, coming through the, the general, uh, one of my uh, senior consultants has recommended that NDAs, because they're very common in campaigns, should be applied. Uh, but what is not conveyed in non-disclosure agreements is that, or for those who may not be familiar, is that anyone can comment. Although some people say that it's closed doors. Not the truth. But people should look into the, the history of that. Uh, I know that there are a lot of campaigns here in Idaho who do do that. Um, and if you actually look at the history, uh, even across the country, that it's a very well-known practice amongst candidates. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned in your remarks, and a couple of questions go to this issue, you're concerned about keeping uh, local government intact, allowing more decisions to be made at the local level. So a couple of questions asked, how would you protect uh, against the Department of Health and Welfare moving its offices and uh, sub-departments to, to Boise out of various communities? Would that be a concern of yours? I'd have to look first into the history of that and why they're making those decisions. I think to have you know full understanding of uh, what's you know the backlog in that story would be fair. Okay, sure. Okay, thank you. So um, you have during the course of the campaign uh, compared and contrasted your position with that of your opponent. Uh, could you tell us what your position is on Medicaid expansion? Well, I'm. Very pro-Medicaid expansion. I've always uh, contributed to the conversations and supporting the details, the facts. Uh, you know, the, the fact of the matter is, if we expand Medicaid, we would actually save our local counties. We would save our state millions of dollars. It's uh, the studies have reported that 600, roughly 600 to 635 million, would be contributed back to the state in within the next 10 years. They said 10 million within the next six months once being passed. Uh, so while we were able to save and then return our taxpayer resources back to our state, it would be uh, net negative or net positive for everyone, all constituents. Uh, not only that, but it would allow, of course, uh, some resources to go back to our local communities, to our healthcare facilities, uh, to ensure that people who are caught in the Medicaid gap would have access to healthcare. So I am very much in support of uh, voting for Prop 2. And, and given your view, given your view on that issue, uh, given the fact that you believe the state would save money by expanding Medicaid, would you therefore bill yourself as a fiscal conservative on that particular issue? Well, not only a fiscal conservative, but fiscally responsible. We have to be accountable to the people rather than shaving off their dollars and following that to other states. What do you say in reaction to the assertion that for 60 years, the Republican Party has controlled the legislature 
and that Idaho ranks 49th in education, that 20% of Idahoans are on welfare, and 18% of the working poor not only hold one but two jobs. How would you assess the GOP's performance over 60 years? Well, again, very poorly, and it's why I'm not running as a Republican. <laughs> I, mean, I helped run a multi-billion dollar corporation very successfully for a reason. But the, the other issue is that I find that Republicans have not been very faithful or honest towards the people of Idaho. And my grandparents have stated to me, even during their time, that our people have been lied and fooled. And it's unfortunate that that is the case. Uh, however, you have a new generation of leaders and a new generation of Idahoans who are reliant upon not only integrity in government, but integrity in our business as leaders of our state. So we have a major responsibility to uphold the facts and ensure that we're learning from the mistakes of others and not continuing down that pathway, which is why you're seeing a lot of our younger people becoming far more progressive and getting more engaged in politics. And come November 6th, we will see a far different turnout. Thank you very much. Uh, Idaho salmon uh, are nearing the point or in danger of extinction. What's your view on breaching the dams on the Lower Snake River as a remedy? Where do you stand on that issue? Well, being very business-minded, and of course, uh, because I have my energy policy background, uh, my understanding serving on the Energy Committee for these many years has been that these dams have been a huge expense at the cost of taxpayers of Idaho. $700 million you pay on top of the utility rates that are very high, which you know has become unaffordable to many families who have to choose between paying rent, education, child care, or their utility bill, which is pretty much staying near your, your mortgage rate. Uh, so it's unfortunate that we continue to roll on that route instead of choosing a far more conservative approach, which should be to decommission those four Snake River dams, build up our economy through supporting and saving our ecosystem. And then in so doing, the economy would actually be boosted by nearly $1.5 billion alone, just within that area. Nationally, the gross domestic product has reached roughly a 375 million, or excuse me, billion dollars just through the activities of outdoor sportsmen. Idaho is considered the number one frontier state in the country next to Alaska. People drive here in thousands to tens of thousands coming to recreate, hunt and fish. When we have more mining, when we have more hydraulic fracking, that drives people away. People do not want to contribute to our GDP. So being business mindful, you want to ensure that people are understanding that the ecosystem is tied to our economy. And when we support our ecosystem, which comes back to decommissioning those four dams to ensure that our fish population, our anadromous fish, salmon, come back because we have a major responsibility not only bringing back the fish population for the entire ecosystem, but being mindful that we have a relationship a treaty with Washington, Oregon, all the Columbia River uh, states, and Canada, along with Alaska, and the entire Pacific region. So we have a major responsibility here in Idaho to unplug the route and the, the regrowth of our salmon population to ensure that every state can benefit from not only the, the salmon, but the economy that it brings on top of the ecosystem that it helps regrow for our entire Western Hemisphere. If you're elected, would you be willing to work with Congressman Mike Simpson to protect the salmon? <laughs> Absolutely. Mike's a good guy. <laughs> I think he wants good things for Idahoans as well. Uh, and we can definitely work together. Thanks. If, if you're elected, uh, would you undertake a concerted effort to protect Idaho's public lands? That is actually one of my major components, is protecting Idaho public lands, being that I'm the only real Idahoan in this conversation of running for governor. Uh, my family has stemmed here for thousands of years. We are deeply rooted. We're not going anywhere. But my major issue is that Idaho land should never be sold off. And if once I am governor, I will certainly protect our public lands for all the greater good. Shifting gears slightly, if you're elected, uh, would you uh, work to, adopt, to pass uh, to work, would you work with the legislature to adopt the add the words legislation to protect the LGBT community? 
I will work with the legislature to do what it takes to ensure that we have zero tolerance for any discrimination of any kind. In, in light of that position, uh, during, the, uh, during the gubernatorial primary on the Republican side, uh, the Republican candidates, including Brad Little, ran television commercials in which they referred to undocumented immigrants as quote-unquote illegals. What's your reaction to the fact that a governmental official would use that term to characterize human beings as illegals? I mean, clearly this person is insensitive to a population of people who are simply human beings. Um, this is why people have to become more activated than their government and to extract you know, individuals who lack leadership, uh, that lack, of course, education, and the ability to understand others. So I would just say to that that it's uh, wholly unfortunate for the people that they have a representative as such, and they should clearly identify people for who they are. If they're undocumented, they're undocumented. There's no such thing as anyone being illegal. Thank you. Uh, on the question of the Idaho National Laboratory, uh, what's your perception of its importance to Idaho's economy, first of all? Just the big, big. Do you want to what, sum that up? What is your perception of the importance of the Idaho National Laboratory to Idaho's economy and the contributions it makes to Idaho? Yes. The Idaho National Laboratory to me has been a very key function in how we are going to be the next Western Hemisphere's leader in energy development. Uh, I see the Idaho National Laboratory as being a key provider in not only their energy resources through small modular reactors, but also a key resource when it comes to clean energy development. All the research that they're doing, I'm very impressed with. In fact, we're going to be visiting the facility soon. Uh, I've been watching them very closely in terms of how they're going to help us not only boost jobs, but boost research that can help not only our local institutions, but local schools and jobs, because we have a responsibility to play to ensure that we lower our utility rates, ensure that we're building on a clean energy plan for the future, and off-ramping from carbonization that is polluting our air system. And if you've been to Boise, you know what I'm talking about. You, you speak often about the, the challenges of bringing uh, economic opportunities to the rural communities. Uh, in your view, what are some approaches that you would take if you're elected governor to help bring those economic opportunities to rural Idaho? Bringing one economic opportunity to rural Idaho comes down to building infrastructure. And of course, pushing and promoting local control, as I spoke of before. When we have local mayors and city council members and county commissioners trying to make decisions for themselves at the local level, what we're seeing now is a legislative body and a governor who have preempted local control, uh, shifting that responsibility away from them. Which is unfortunate because if they want to raise taxes through a local option tax, they should be able to do so. If they want to build a new school, they should be able to do so. Build a new road or a bridge. That should be up to our local authorities, local constituents. Everyone should have a seat at the table to decide what they see fit. As governor, this is what I support in ensuring that we're not getting in the way, not providing more roadblocks or bureaucratic red tape for them to get through, and of course supporting local decision makers because I also want to see the will of the people come to light uh, on top of ensuring that we have block grants or vouchers that we can actually coordinate with the federal government to get back to rural sectors of Idaho, such as building on uh, rehabilitative, rehabilitative health programming, uh, ensuring resources come from our general tax fund back to rural communities uh, for education. Uh, one of the major issues that I've had is that since we've passed the state tax lottery system, we have utilized that as a front to now deploy those funds, state taxpayer funds, from going back to education. And because that's been the case, we have defunded our public education schools, now overtaxing our people at the rural level through supplemental levies, which is a poor exchange in many opinions to say that this is why we lack in becoming number one or serving our people and providing the best education that our children deserve. We deserve better at the local level. follow-up to, oh, go ahead. I was going to add to that, uh, Please. but I really appreciate the clap. Um, the, in addition to, and this is why it's, I point that out, is because education has become the foundation to all economic opportunity. 
this is our people's way to provide for themselves and to build on the local economy. Small businesses thrive on not only responsible citizens to contribute, but to be educated. We had 7,000 unfilled STEM jobs last year. Idaho has become one of the fastest growing tech sector industries in the country. So now that we've become the fast growing tech sector here in the southern region, they have seen an, a gap in terms of our human resource. So they're looking to have more trained citizens of Idaho to be able to employ, but if we're not able to keep up with them, we're not keeping up with the growth of our economy. So education is key to this component of growing not only the rural areas of Idaho, but ensuring that we have the infrastructure to connect the corridor for transportation and commerce, and then rural broadband. Small businesses thrive on rural broadband, and they're not able to grow in rural Idaho through tourism, which we don't support at this point, but expanding in tourism would be key for small businesses and ensuring that we're connecting these conversations and relationships between local schools, small businesses, our universities, and of course, major corporations who are in this state who are looking to build mentorship programs and of course, uh, you know, internships and wanting to build in Idahoans into their, their businesses. Thank you. Uh, if elected governor, would you lead an effort to rebuild what many people uh, perceive to be uh, our, the, the state of disrepair of our roads and bridges? Would you take that as a priority if you're elected as governor? Infrastructure in Idaho is a major priority. Of course, it's uh, up there and it will be competing with education. That is another challenge that we see because we have to start growing our income when it comes to not increasing taxes. So this comes by means of decommissioning those dams, ensuring that we're expanding in tourism, expanding in ag. This is why we want to promote optimal uh, optimums. Options like hemp. You know, people are looking at exporting hemp in our state, but we haven't legalized it. So, you know, there's multiple options in this state to ensure growth. Of course, opening up our Public Utilities Commission to incentivize other clean energy companies like solar, like wind, uh, promoting uh, research when it comes to geothermal and biomass. Uh, we have energy partners in this state and surrounding our state that we can draw into uh, help build not only cleaner jobs, but uh, really growing uh, our economy and our bottom line uh, revenue. So we have to look at all of these options, expand in everywhere possible, uh, and ensure that we're being as efficient as we can possibly be, especially when we look at how much timber we have, how are we going to optimize the timber growth and try to also counter that with fire suppression costs. So there's a lot of areas of interest and need, but when it comes down to infrastructure, we have to have the money available and not continue to bond ourselves into debt and mortgage our children's future. We have to be fiscally responsible here and now, and that comes by making sure that we're not sacrificing any dollars to education, because when you look at who I will represent in terms of governing, it will be our children first and foremost, which is why education will be the priority. Transportation, broadband infrastructure, We'll have to find those resources which are available. It comes by also pulling in some of those federal funds to our rural areas where uh, those areas have a higher need uh, because we found out that in the rural sectors, roughly 20% are unserved. So we'll, we're going to address those needs first. Thank you. Back, back to education for a moment. Uh, would you support the removal of the supermajority requirement for local bond votes? The removal of, uh, yes, we can certainly promote it. I found that to be an issue for supplemental levies or other bonds at the local level. Um, most importantly, though, it's going to come down to the vote of the people. Um, you know, it should be over 50% a vote. So I will maintain that over 50%. I've heard some trying to push for two thirds, and that's the question, and if that's the specific part of it, then I would be against it. Continuing on education for a moment. How do you think Idaho should properly fund education, since that, you've said that's a priority of yours? Properly funding education wholly means, uh, if you look at it the way the, the base funding goes, 73% of our state budget is made up of both sales and income tax. The challenge is that a lot of those funds are not resorted back to our communities. You know, oftentimes we're even resorting to tax exemptions and subsidies for corporations in our state, uh, roughly into to the tune of nearly $2 billion. We're also contributing a lot of these funds to the Constitutional Defense Fund, private prison contracts out of state. We're contributing to uh, fraudulent contracts. You know, here even in Idaho, we found out through the DMV, you know, if anyone knows this, but you know, just the, the, not only the miscalculation, but the mismanagement of multiple contracts in our state. 
that is not a big shock because this has been very consistent in nature by the current administration. When we wholly are mindful of where we're mismanaging funds and how to be responsible and accountable to the people when it comes to now our future base of resources, this is where we're going to save our taxpayers and then be able to resort those monies back to where they should be. And again, because I pointed out the state lottery before, people thought that that state lottery, when they passed this by an initiative, when it was on the ballot, people voted for it because they thought that this money would be in addition to the state general fund, not a replacement of the state general fund monies. You, you mentioned earlier, uh, we've only gone through 73 questions, by the way, so right. far. No, that's why I, I left my intro short. Here. I knew everyone had a lot of questions. Well, the record pace very here, sharp folks here. So, uh, you mentioned in, in your remarks uh, that you favor clean energy and you want to promote decarbonization. What can we do here in Idaho to fight climate change? Well, first of all, we have to acknowledge that it exists. <laughs> We've become a state uh, built on electing leaders who are climate change deniers. We've actually even gone so far so to be very extreme to even inject that sort of belief and philosophy into our curriculum and extracted you know, that level of education from our children. So we want to start taking a hard look at where we're impacting not only education of our future, but starting to now implement facts and research that's mindful and course sustaining so that our, our future generations understand the direction of where we're going into being more mindful and to impacting our environment, ensuring that we're utilizing the best energy possible and being mindful of our water resources, uh, which we're not at this point. Uh, people think that it's a, an infinite resource, but in fact water is a finite resource. And the fact that we have so many water wars, everyone claiming rights here and there, uh, we have deregulated even the amount of pollution going into our river systems, into our lakes. Uh, this is where we need to stop. We must acknowledge that not only does climate change exist, and it's a very big reality, but even our, us in the agribusiness industry have been hit hard when it comes to our yields and uh, you know, how we're being impacted even in our bottom line. But on top of that, the rise in forest fires, the change of uh, temperatures in our water climate, uh, the overgrowth of even, um, even those, uh, the, excuse me, the, uh, I'm thinking of milfoil, but the, the invasive species that are impacting our resources here. So all of that is impacted by, of course, the human impact, biodiversity, and the, the climate change. But we have to be mindful, this needs to be discussed in the State House. We haven't yet had even a committee hearing in the State House to address this issue. But as governor, you have to lead this conversation. People must understand that this is a very real issue for all of us, and we are impacting the world by our decisions made here in Idaho. Thank you. You have held, uh, both through the Tribal Council and other positions, a number of, of management positions. Would, would you describe for our audience some of your experience in management and what your management style might look like you know, should you be elected governor? Interestingly enough, I've never been in a room where I was elected by acclamation. Oftentimes, I was always working somewhere else and they would say, Paulette can do the job, we are going to elect her by acclamation again. Uh, it often comes down to just the fact that you work hard. For me, I've been very direct in my leadership, uh, very open and forthcoming, and uh, because I have a very uh, collaborative notion to my position when it comes down to building or growing developments, uh, people have been very supportive of my direction. And you know, when I served in the National Gaming Association, I was the finance chair and the energy chair to promote growth and development amongst the corporation, which is a nonprofit corporation or association for tribes across the country, the 567 tribes, in fact. And so we were promoting economic development, uh, promoting clean energy renewables through our uh, not only our economic business, our developments, but growing jobs and growing a stable economy for states across the country. And in that uh, arena, I've been able to promote even legislation at the national level, working with our president through the White House and uh, promoting other uh, forms of uh, developments in, like I said, across the state, uh, here in Idaho and in the country, uh, which has been a part of my background in the business world. Uh, I've even worked with areas across the world. But uh, most importantly, when I served at the local level with the tribe, the tribal council, I sat on a uh, council of seven members, 
And in that regard, they elected me to serve as the uh, leader of our elders, the elder representative. And uh, that was probably one of the, the highest uh, areas of uh, honor that I received because I was the youngest person on the council. And the elders had elected me to represent them in this voice of not only local to state to national leadership, uh, but that goes to show you just kind of the, the privilege that I've had and the ability to rise up and really uh, learn from others in that capacity. So from serving on the Tribal Council and then even before that I served at the uh, university level under the president of the university, served on his advisory council. I also served as the, as the student ambassador of the University of Washington and then been able to just uh, gain ground and position working with other local leaders on the King, uh, Seattle City Council. Um, and then became more invested in just community growth and development. I went to Gonzaga Prep, which is a private institution that promotes servant leadership. And in my own culture, my upbringing uh, on the reservation in northern Idaho, uh, my elders taught me the same thing, servant leadership. And because I come from these leaders and chiefs, it's always about servant leadership. So there's a constant mainframe, and every de decision I made is based off of where I was asked to lead. And when I went to the state level, my grandfather, in fact, who was this World War II veteran, he was the one who made this decision on my behalf in a way. He said, you have to be the good apple amongst all the bad because people have lost faith in their government and only you can bring everyone together to make sure that you fix a system that is broken and therefore you have to do this. Uh, thank you. On that theme of, of the, law, the public's loss of confidence in our institutions, not only around Washington, but perhaps here in Idaho, what would you do to try to restore that faith through your management style? Are you a consensus builder? You've mentioned on the campaign trail that you are a good listener. What's your, what's your management style like? Well, it kind of speaks for itself when you're the lone woman in a male-dominated industry. I serve on an executive level board uh, across the country and you know people have supported me by acclamation for over eight years and I've served in that capacity in the senior executive role for so long that I think it's just that the, the record stands for itself uh, that people have confidence and faith in you to do what is right by others and uh, so I would just say that that in its of itself uh, goes to show that you know when it comes down to leadership here in Idaho how that carries over is experience in collaboration experience in integrity and building for others uh, especially when it comes down to understanding the economy uh, jobs and of course uh, clearly education uh, all of that tends to carry over to this position because i've lived with the people was raised by the people have represented the people for these many years and now uh, have a clear pathway to understand a way that we can build idaho for the better, better future for the next four years there's a lot of interest here in this community and around the state uh, on the issue of horse racing gambling, Proposition 1. Would you tell us where you stand on that issue of Proposition 1? Well, Prop 1, I've never been in favor of Prop 1. Uh, I, was, I would say, personally, I am going to vote no uh, because that's my personal belief. Uh, but I will support the will of the people. If the will of the people is to vote for and it passes come November 6th, then I will support it as governor. But I will be mindful that people must recognize that this initiative has been distorting the truth. It has been playing to the people that it's supporting horse racing when in fact it is not supporting horse racing because horse racing is already legal. What they're looking to promote is legalizing, which, which one thing is already unconstitutional to support slot machines, but the people would be voting to legalize slot machines and building casinos up and down our state. Now I, what I am concerned of is that we, this process of legalizing casinos and these small slot machines would then promote us having to be more heavy-handed in regulation. We'll have to build a gaming commission that is more mindful and well-educated of the issue. We'll also have to increase security, a police force that will have to watch and guard uh, the process and development of these casinos because it actually draws in a different field of interest. And I'm very protective of Idaho. And because I'm protective of Idaho and our children, I want to make sure that we're not going down this very aggressive path that we've seen uh, some challenges uh, and I, I'm very wholly concerned of sending our resources in that area where we can send resources towards uh, education. Uh, you, you've said that you're in favor of the legalization of marijuana, bringing Idaho into a consistent policy with its neighbors, uh, west and east and perhaps into Utah now. Uh, would you explain to us why you support the legalization of marijuana? 
Well, I fully support it because it is a natural medicine. It's a, a natural al alternative that is better for folks who have seen not only a, a rise in their health, increased health, but have seen it as a, a better alternative to even off-ramp other drugs like the opioid, addressing the opioid crisis and overdose of heroin. Uh, people are dying left and right using synthetic marijuana even uh, that the FDA approved. But if you legalize medicinal cannabis in the state of Idaho, you will not be alone. You have Washington, Oregon, uh, Nevada, is it Montana, and now Utah, who have legal, legalized uh, forms of marijuana, whether it's CBD oil or the full-on legalization of uh, marijuana and recreational use. But the point is that Idaho has an opportunity to serve its people best because many Idahoans have asked for the legalization of medicinal marijuana for their needs and, of course, to ensure that they're not being uh, criminalized for the use of a natural medicine that has been grown here for thousands of years. But I also see it as an opportunity for Idaho to grow in, uh, another base uh, resource that we can tax and heavily regulate for the benefit of everyone. Thank you. We're up to 92 questions asked now. Thank Good. you. <laughs> That's what we're here for. I drove four hours for this. Well, eight technically. We're going to expand our time till about three or four this afternoon. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> uh, let's talk about the national exposure that you've received by virtue of your of your candidacy here. What's that meant to you, and how would you utilize that national exposure uh, to promote the interest of Idaho? We've been doing that already. We've been going out to uh, all over the state, and as we come, uh, to whether it's north or south. We're inviting the national media because they are saying, you know, we want to cover this race. We want to know what Idaho is about. So we're getting everyone from the New York Times to CNN to Fox who are coming into our state and wanting to bring to light not only our campaign but our culture. So we're driving the spotlight to our most rural areas, to our most impoverished communities, to our most unheard and ignored communities in the state of Idaho, which is imperative because those voices need to be heard and we're bringing them not only to the light but ensuring that we're building a solution to address their concerns and thankfully the national media has been very supportive of our race showing what we're doing and I think that helps uh, really build Idaho because Idaho is oftentimes considered Iowa. <laughs> One of the I states? One of the I states. Um, since you were here last spring uh, and you're speaking about the Idaho National Laboratory. Uh, what have you learned since last spring about the work of, of the lab that you think is important to share with your audience? I think the most critical uh, misunderstanding is that people will associate the waste repository with the Idaho National Laboratory. They're completely separate entities. And so they're holding the INL accountable for you know, the legacy waste or you know, potential other waste coming through, uh, which as governor I'm going to hold to the 1995 agreement uh, and ensure that we're ridding of our legacy waste, but the, the challenge remains that it's a, it's a poor slant towards the, the laboratory. So people should understand that they're very separate. Thank you. Uh, in, in your view, uh, what's the most important thing you could accomplish if you should be elected governor of Idaho? Changing the face of our, of our government. People need to have faith again. They need to know that this government belongs to them. Essentially, Idaho belongs to all of us, which is why it's a part of my, my mainframe. And I want to ensure that people understand that while they're born and raised here, while they live here, they're a part of these conversations. And as we see now, nobody is a part of these conversations. Unless you're a millionaire or you have a lot of money in your pocket, you know, you're shut out. I've learned this from experience. You have to be one of the privileged few to have a seat at the table. And it should never be that way. My grandfather reminded me that when we are a people who have built the Constitution, taught people independence and freedom and what that means, and now it's completely distorted with all these fractionated political systems, political parties, we are driving our people apart. And in all this divisiveness, we're only hurting each other. So at the end of the day, it comes down to unifying our government, unifying our communities, ensuring that our children understand that they have a future to fight for, that they are a part of. And as governor, this is what I bring to the table, the unity and the future of our state. Thank you. We're wrapping 
unfortunately running out of time together here today. Uh, tell us about your position on the idea of raising the minimum wage and perhaps achieving what is called a livable wage. Yeah. Raising the wage, uh, I actually promoted a legislation uh, years back to uh, index the wages through the Consumer Price Index. Uh, how I did that was to ensure responsibility and accountability for those local businesses because small businesses should not be sticker shocked with a high amount. We want to make sure that we're, you know, accounting inflation and then trying to get ahead of inflation because even if we raise through the consumer price index, it will still not keep up with the cost of living here in Idaho, especially as we're growing faster and faster. I mean, we're looking at roughly 200,000 more people by the year 2025. Uh, and just in the Treasure Valley alone, the, the Boise mayor has said we're going to reach nearly a million people in Treasure Valley uh, by that year, within the next six years or so. So as we're fastly growing, you know, we're competing with it, rising housing costs, which are unaffordable, uh, the, the rise in our taxes. Uh, we're looking at even areas of uh, people being challenged with health care. Most people I meet along this trail are single mothers or single parents or just in rural Idaho who cannot afford uh, health care at these high premiums of roughly 1500 to 2000 a month. 2000 in insurance premiums, that's pretty high. Uh, but the fact that we have made everything nearly inaccessible and unaffordable means that Idaho has a lot to do with uh, raising the wage, ensuring that we are keeping up with the cost of living. So that to me is a livable wage, is ensuring that we're not only getting ahead of the cost of living, but uh, are keeping up with the cost of inflation, but getting ahead of it. Thank you. In the, in the very last couple of questions, now that we have the easy ones out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> These are all great questions, by the way. Thank you. Our audience is attentive and interested in what you have to say. Uh, we can't let pass the, the fact that on the national scene, we have yet an, another woman coming forward and accusing a very powerful official of sexual assault three decades ago. What's your view in general about the importance of the Me Too movement to women here in America? I think it's empowering for women who have been uh, plagued by you know, being subdued to lesser than their male counterparts. And there was a lot of women executives that I've met across this trail who have said to me that you know, this Me Too movement has exposed uh, and supported the women who have felt uh, buried uh, in these issues. You know, we've had people even in the state who have come to me during uh, times when even you know, a few decades ago, if they were to raise their voice and challenge their authority, uh, in this process of saying that they were harassed or uh, harmed in some way, that no one would listen, and that it, it would only serve to stigmatize them and then create this, uh, this more ill-reflective Ill development on their career and their personal life. So it's good to see that women now are being treated fairly and with respect, and that their voice is taken seriously. Uh, but at the same time, we want to be careful and cautious with uh, this Me Too movement of claiming anything out of order. Um, so I'm, I'm wholly mindful of it, but at the same time, I am appreciative that people are watching you know, what's going on with how women are treated this day and age, because Idaho has even been ranked as 50th in the country when it comes to treatment of women. You know, when it comes down to reproductive health care rights, when it comes down to equal pay, and of course even harassment up, we have to be respectful and mindful, and this is another reason why women are excited and supporting this campaign, because we're finally able to see a woman lead but also supporting the voices of other women because here in Idaho, you know, we're seeing the rise of even deaths amongst our um, partners. You know, five women were murdered just this summer. And you know, five people in, back in July alone, women, by the hands of their abusers. So this is a major issue in our state that we want to address. Uh, the Me Too movement is, you know, of course, uh, flashed across the country. And uh, we're seeing more and more people step up to support themselves. And, and this is why it's good as a, a culture to be addressed, because women should not be disrespected or mistreated, uh, nor raped or murdered, and we're seeing those numbers rise. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Jordan, you've obviously found your voice. Uh, you're an independent woman. You're seeking Idaho's highest office. I was, was raised there? by an independent woman. Yeah, that's it. Well, we would like to know, uh, was there a moment in your life or perhaps several moments where you realized you had a voice and you wanted to speak out on issues of concern to you? Was there a point in your life when such lightning struck? <laughs> uh, 
So my grandmothers, they were chiefs, and they were formidable women, powerful. And it didn't matter how tall they were. <laughs> I'm, I'm six feet, I'm tall, but they were short, you know, but they were still very powerful because of their compassion. They're very empathetic. And because they're strong leaders, they taught people how to treat them. My grandmothers who raised me, since I was five, they handed me the mic, taught me how to be gracious and respectful of others, but to also lead from that level on. Uh, so I'm thankful for that leadership who has paved the way for me. Uh, that's the reason why I'm voiceful. I'm just basically emulating the leadership of my mother and my grandmothers before me. Uh, when you have leadership to look to, which our young women here deserve, uh, you certainly have a major responsibility to be accountable to that voice and the voices before you. So my voice started thousands of years ago. I'm simply a vessel of their teachings. Thank you. Well, I have to say this has been a very illuminating hour with you. Thanks so much for joining us.